<laughs> that's right. Chronicles has a lot of names in it. Um, that's why when the king of Persia uh, needed to go back to sleep, what did he read? He read, <laughs> he read the Chronicles of the Kingdom because there were all those names in there. And so he just wanted to get back to sleep as quickly as possible. But that's, of course, when he ran across Mordecai. Okay. Uh, anything else happened? Any other discoveries? Shibi is a fire conveyor. Say that again. The surf was really good at Shibi. Oh, good. It was firing. Okay. Now I, now I put that together. All right. So is uh, which which uh, Shibi says three bricks, right? Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So which one were you at? Okay. All right. So are you um, are you goofy foot or? No, I'm normal. You're normal. Okay. <coughs> I'm normal too. It's good to meet normal people. All right. Let's uh, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this good day. Thank you for the good things you allowed us to get done, and we pray now, Lord, that you might bless this time and bless your word, and bless these precious, precious people. We love you, Lord, and thank you for all your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this morning, we talked about the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, but I didn't want to get away from the doctrine of the Holy Spirit without, being, without talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit and how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I know that many of you know this by heart, by experience, etc. Uh, but I want to be able to share it with those who have not known that and with those who have to be able to share it with someone else in a way that makes sense. OK, um, so there we go. Wait a minute. We're going straight to number one here. Number that needs to be number one. Okay. Okay, we got it. The first thing that is necessary when someone is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're gonna have to write these down. We don't have a print off on this one for you, is that you have to want it. You have to desire it. Desire to be filled with the Spirit. In, uh, that's supposed to be Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. The prophet says, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. God speaking through him says, I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. So he makes it clear first when he's talking about his water and the floods on the dry ground that he really means in the parallelism in which he defines the first half of the parallel and the second part, I will pour my spirit. That's what I'm really talking about when I'm talking about the water. Uh, when I'm going to pour out my water, I'm pouring out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. But on whom does God pour out? According to verse 3. Take a look. On whom does he pour out the Spirit? Him who is thirsty. That's right. The person who is thirsting for it. The person who really wants the Lord uh, to control him. Now, when Jesus stood and cried on the last day of the feast in John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39, he stood and he cried saying, he who is thirsty, let him come to me and what? Drink. Drink. Same idea here. I will pour water on him who is thirsty. Let whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes on me out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, which those um, who believe in him should receive. So... Um, Rivers of living water speaks of the Holy Spirit, he says there in that passage. 
It's thirst that God answers, that God looks for. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, if I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, do I want it bad enough? Am I thirsting for the Holy Spirit's presence? Am I thirsting for his power? Am I thirsting for his control? Am I thirsting for his working in me, in my life? If I do, then, of course, that will lead uh, to something else. The next condition for being filled with the Holy Spirit is confession. Confession. Who has uh, 1 John 1, verse 9 memorized? Who's got it memorized? What's it say? Very good. Okay. Uh, the, my, my version said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So cleansing, purifying happens when we come to the Lord and confess our sin. What does it mean to confess your sin? Anybody? What's it mean to confess your sin? Yes. Yes. You did something wrong. And what's the wording that we use? The Greek word confess there is homo legeo. For those of you who like to write down Greek words. Homo legeo means to say, legeo, the same, homo, to say the same thing. When you're saying the same thing about your sin, it means that you're, you're saying exactly what it is. So don't call it something else when it's worse than that. Don't give God synonyms. Don't give God call words. Say exactly what it was. Lord, this was lust. I lusted. Lord, I slandered that person. Lord, I, whatever the thing was that you did, tell God exactly what it was and ask his cleansing and ask his forgiveness and ask his control. Whatever it is, don't call it something else. Don't call it uh, inordinate affection if it's something worse than that. Any questions on that? Okay, confess. Third is ask. If you're now getting serious before God and you want the Holy Spirit's control, ask for it. Jesus says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who what? Ask him. Those who ask him. Have I asked the Father for the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Have I asked the Holy Spirit to fill my life? Notice this is third on the list. It's after the other two. He knows that you're serious when you're asking for it. Ask for the control of the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, then, obey. Obey. If you want the Holy Spirit to fill you and stay in fullness and in control, um, then obey him. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And there's two ways, by the way, I, before I say that. There's, there's two things that we want to highlight when we talk about obedience in terms of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. One is negative, the other is positive. The negative one is quenching not the Holy Spirit. Uh, excuse me, I, did, I said it wrong. Please don't write that down. <laughs> I said it in reverse. 
the negative one is grieving not the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Grieve not. Now, what does that mean? I like the French translation of this word because it's do not make the Holy Spirit cry. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit makes choices, we're told, in, uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians. He chooses what gift you're about to receive when you, when you become a believer. Um, but the Holy Spirit is also deeply sensitive, very sensitive. And so when we do something, when we say something, when, especially when we speak something against another person, he's listening very closely. And it hurts him very deeply, especially if that person that you're speaking against is another believer, uh, because that's someone also in whom he lives. So he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Don't make him cry, because you are sealed with him for the day of redemption. He's in there until Jesus comes back or you are in Jesus' presence, which means like it or not, he stuck with you, right? <laughs> and me. He stuck with us. So make his tour of duty in you, make it a joyful one for him. He's listening very closely. He loves you very deeply. And so uh, don't make him cry. That's the negative. The positive is do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Now, grieving the, sp the Spirit is when the Holy Spirit says no to something. Whatever it is, don't lie and you lie. Don't steal and you steal. Don't whatever it is and you do it. If you go against the will of the Holy Spirit, when he's saying no and you say yes, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. But quenching the Holy Spirit's a little different. Quenching the Holy Spirit's when the Holy Spirit says, yes, yes, witness to that person. Yes, pray. Yes, praise. Yes, worship. Yes, fellowship. Yes, help that brother out. Whatever it is where he's pushing you to do something and because you don't want to do it, you don't feel like it, or... You want to be too polite. You don't want to ruffle any feathers. You just don't do anything or don't say anything. That's uh, quenching the spirit. The spirit is a fire, fire inside, and he's flaming up toward a, a course of action for you. And when you put the brakes on and you stop things, then you quench it, and that makes that fire die down. So don't grieve him. Don't say, uh, don't say yes when he says no, and don't quench him. Don't say no when he says yes. And then lastly, walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, that's, I didn't mean, that's a mistake there on the second parenthesis. It's supposed to be 5.16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. NIV says live in the spirit. It's the same idea. It's, it's habitual obedience. When you obey him, you're taking your very first step. It's like a little baby. Any of you parents in here? All single? Okay. No parents. Uh, we had a lot of married couples at Cape and Ray, so I wasn't sure if they had them here or not. There's a requirement to not be married. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, if you are a parent, you'll, you'll, you'll see the day when you coax your first steps out of your newborn baby, whether the little boy or the little girl, you, you try and get them to take their first steps. After about a year, you're trying to cook dinner and that little thing is just running around pell-mell, 100 miles an hour in back of you. You got a pan in one hand, and you're trying to catch the little guy in the other one because by now he knows how to walk. Walking is habitual. Same is true for people. 
we take our first steps of obedience, sometimes it's hard. We walk in obedience, it has become habitual. And that's what the Father's after. He's after you walking in the spirit, a spirit of habitual obedience. Okay? And so um, you say, well, how do will I know it when I'm filled with the spirit? And I would say yes, yes. But you do so by faith. You ask for the spirit's control by faith. What does Ephesians 5.18 say? Anybody? What's Ephesians 5.18 say? Anybody got that one down? That's one you definitely should memorize. I have it here. Okay, wonderful. Read it for us. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, and then speaking to yourselves in verse 19 and, and onward, yeah. Okay, uh, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why would Paul put it like that? Why would he drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit? Anybody? Why would he say that? Have you ever seen somebody drunk with wine? Probably, you, you know, you're out on a Friday night with your friends and you, you come home and, and suddenly you're, you're going through a place that uh, uh, has got a, a few inebriated people and they're staggering around. Um, you've probably seen some, some people who were drunk with wine. Is a person drunk with wine in control of himself, or is he controlled by the substance? He's controlled by the substance, right? That's the parallel Paul is drawing. He's saying when you're in, when you're filled with the Spirit, it's in, this, in the same light as being drunk with wine, in the sense that something outside yourself is in control. In this case, it's the Holy Spirit who is in control. The Holy Spirit is who is in control. And that's the position he wants. He wants you to walk in the Spirit. He wants you to be under the control, under the influence, we say, of the, of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, it's also, uh, when we say you're filled with the, with the Spirit, it also means empowering. Empowering. In Micah, uh, he says, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Why? Because the Spirit was in charge and the Spirit was filling him so the Spirit was empowering him to speak. He couldn't stop himself from speaking. He had to speak. You remember the, uh, the apostles in the book of Acts when they were in front of the high priests who were speaking in Jesus' name. They said, we cannot help but speak the things which uh, God has shown to us. And so... That has to be true of you. He's a fire inside. He's empowering you. And he's controlling you. And you want to be under his power and control. So when you ask him, ask in faith. If you have asked sincerely, if you have asked with a desire to obey, if you have asked repentantly where you've confessed your sins to him, if you have asked sincerely, he will, he will fill you. So then obey by faith and trust God to fill, fill you on his own timetable. He may do it immediately, and that's wonderful. He may see if you're serious or not, and sometimes he does, and then he'll fill you as he desires to do so. But let him be the one who's in charge. Those are the steps to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Any questions before we go on? Any, oops. Okay, that was the drum section. Okay. Any questions? All right. Uh, then did every did everybody? Let me see if I can. Uh, yeah. Did everybody get um, abiding? Part one, Jesus teaches the abiding life, part one. Everybody get that? Okay. Uh 
There we go. Um, okay, Cooper, I'm pushing F5 and I'm not. Uh, yeah. Hey, Dad. Hello. Oh, I can't do it, Mary. <laughs> Let's get through this stuff. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we're going further on in. Um, in John chapter 15, and I just realized that I came in without my Bible. That's the uh, cardinal sin of a Bible teacher, is to not have your Bible. You don't memorize, right? <laughs> well, some parts I do, this part I do. Thank you, babe. Okay, John chapter 15. Is everybody there? Let's get over there if you're not there yet. John chapter 15. This is the last of the I am statements that you s talked about yesterday uh, with Tony in, uh, in the Gospel of John. The last of the I am statements. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean, or the Greek is, you are already pruned. You are pruned clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And now he gives his command. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me, you can do what? Nothing, nothing. Okay, we're just going to stop there for just a second. That's the second time the Lord Jesus has made an exclusive statement in this upper room discourse. The first was in chapter 14, in verse 6. What did he say that was an exclusive statement? What's he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's an exclusive statement, right? And I told you that you guys had a sacred trust given to you. You have to uphold that exclusive statement in a world that denies it. Okay? That's the first exclusive statement. So Jesus is the only way for salvation. That's an exclusive statement. Then here's the next one in verse 5. I'm the vain, which is he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So here's the second exclusive statement. If you're talking about sanctification, becoming holy, uh, living under the, the Lord's control, bearing fruit for him, growing in Christ, living a godly life, if you're talking about sanctification, it's Jesus or it's nothing. So in John 14, 6, in terms of salvation, it's Jesus or it's nothing. In John 15, 5, in terms of sanctification, it's Jesus or it's nothing. Got it? Two exclusive statements. Jesus is the only one, of course, who has the right to make those statements. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. That's an awesome statement. 
By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will prove to be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Okay, now, we covered this first part this morning, so I'm just going to review it with you really quickly now because the same principle is going to underlie both the fact that Jesus was a worker with the Father and that now he wants you to bear fruit as someone abiding, abiding in him. And that ideal is in Christ. The ideal humanity is meant to function under the power and control of deity. That was true for Adam, and it was true for Christ. It's true for us. Agreed? Remember? Agreed. Okay. What Jesus did, Philippians 2, uh, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So, how Jesus worked in this condition. We saw from his statements earlier in John, I can of myself do nothing, right? As I hear, I judge, my judgment is righteous because I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. All right, so we, or we agreed that Jesus worked in the power of the Father. Right, okay. Again, Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He and that I do how much of myself? Nothing of myself. But as the Father taught me, I speak these things. And He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. John 8, 28. Again, John 10, 36, Jesus says, Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. So Jesus is working in the power of the Father, right? Again, he says, I have not spoken on my own authority. The Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his command is everlasting. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So when Jesus taught, in whose power did he teach? The Father's power, right. And here in our text in John chapter 14, verse 10 and 11, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now by this time, you may be saying to yourself, why in the world are we going over this again? And yeah, that's a great question to ask. And the answer is simple, because from here on out, what happened to Jesus, now he is entrusting to you. It isn't going to be the Jesus who is operating in the Father's power, in the Father's authority. It's going to be you operating in Jesus' power, in Jesus' authority. That's what he means by abide in me and I in you. He's talking about you taking on the mindset of Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul said? Have this mindset in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then what did he do? Though he was uh, God himself and in full divine authority, what did he do? He emptied himself. He made himself nothing. So now, God is going to call you to make yourself nothing, to die to self, in order that the life of Christ can be swapped for your life. See, up till now, 
up to this point in your life, 432 or 433 in, in, uh, uh, this, on Wednesday in April, uh, up to this point in your life, it's been maybe you and Jesus, and maybe before that just you, and now from here on out, it's going to be you in Jesus and Jesus in you. The same which was true for his father is now going to be true for you. That's what he's going to want from you. That's what he's asking from you. He's asking you to so abide in him that his person, his power, his fullness comes into you so that the life of Christ can be expressed in you. Now he will express it differently in each one of you. Each one of you is going to, has been given a different personality. Each one of you has a different temperament. Some of you are hard chargers, go-getters. You know, Pastor Rick, he is a charger, right? He just is a go-getter. Zoom, zoom, zoom. You, you, you get exhausted just trying to follow him around. Others of you are contemplative. You kind of sit back and you meditate. You think about things. I think Maddie may be one of those kinds of people. Uh, Everybody's going to have a different personality. Some of you are going to be analytical, logical. You're going to think things through. Some of you are just going to bolt into the next uh, opportunity and just work your head off. That's your temperament. Everybody here has a different temperament. Plus, when Jesus left this earth, he, all gave, he gave us each one a different spiritual gifting. Uh, some of you are going to be teachers. Some of you have the gift of service. Some of you have the gift of encouraging other people. Some of you have the gift of speaking out boldly. Some of you have the gift of showing mercy to others, people who are hurting, people who are in need. Everybody here has a different gift. So you all have different temperaments and personalities. You all have different gifts. Jesus is going to show up in each one of you in a different way. But one thing is going to be true. At this point out, you're going to be accountable for living under, in, under the abiding life of Jesus Christ, where Jesus is going to be expressing his life fully in you, and you're going to have to be denying what you want, denying, if necessary, your own personality, and submitting to the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do that happen? It happens by you giving way to the deity of Christ in the exact same way that he gave way to the deity of the Father. Remember, we've, we've learned all, all this time, it's always been the Father in Jesus, the Father in Jesus. Now, it's Jesus in you. Jesus in you. I'm abiding in you so that you can bear fruit for him. Let's look and see how that works, how this works in us. Uh, I need somebody on each slide to read, to be a voice for that slide, okay? Uh, who wants to be a voice for this slide? Who's going to read it to the rest of us? Okay, go for it. Read it nice and loud. There was never, the, there never was a moment in which the Lord Jesus as a man was not God. He was eternal God in the beginning, with God as Father. But when he came into this world, he came to be a man, as God always intended all mankind to be, both for Jesus as well as for us. This perfect manhood, this perfect humanity consists in clear and complete manifestation of the Father. Okay, so Jesus was always showing God the Father, right? What we've, what we've been reading about. He was always God, but as a man, he let the Father fill him and work in him. Okay, now who wants to read the, who's going to read the next one? Okay, Lexi, read the next one. The Lord Jesus came into this world to redeem us and to restore us to our true humanity and function, to restore us to the life that was lost in Adam so that we can be in him and he can be in us. Right. Adam was always designed to be operating in the power of deity, but he gave that up when he tried to become like God as the serpent uh, tempted him. And that was lost in Adam. But it's regained in Christ. Okay, now who's going to read the next one? Who's going to be our voice? Yes. As the Lord Jesus Christ walked on earth as a man, he represented his body to his Father so that his humanity might be put to its 
intended purpose, and that purpose was to demonstrate and express the divine life to manifest God the Father. Right. He realized that the purpose of man was to uh, allow the Father to fill him so that he could present what a God-controlled life was like to the rest of people and expressing the, the divine life and manifesting God the Father. Okay? Uh, who's going to be the voice for our next one? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. So that we may do his work, his way, when we, when and where he may demand it. Okay, awesome. Okay, now, uh, so the whole thing here is that we operate in Jesus' deity in the same way that he operated in his Father's deity. Okay, does that principle come through, I hope, by now? Okay, good. Uh, who wants to be our voice for the next one? Yes. Okay. When we as human beings make ourselves available to Jesus Christ in the same way that he made himself available to God the Father, then Jesus will be to us in our humanity what the Father was to him in his humanity, i.e. the person and power in charge and in control. Major Ian Thomas, the indwelling life of Christ. Right. Okay, so... All these slides that we've all just been reading here have all been one extended quote. And that quote has been from Major Ian Thomas. Major Thomas was the person who founded Cape and Ray this, and was our teacher at Cape and Ray, the school that both Rick and I went to. And uh, he founded Torchbearers that we're hoping that Anchor House becomes a part of. Uh, this is the principle the main principle that Major Thomas taught, and that is that now you and your humanity are to live under the power of the deity of the Son of God in the same way that Jesus, while he was on earth as the perfect man, operated totally in the power of his Father. Jesus is to you what the Father was to Jesus. Does that make sense? Get that? Let me say that one more time. Jesus is to you what the Father was to Jesus. Jesus operated in the power of the Father all the time. And Jesus wants you to operate in his deity's power all the time. Make sense? Okay, good. The secret of the Christian life and service is to be always available to the indwelling Lord Jesus with your life swapped for his in the same way that he was always available to the Father. Now, let me ask you a question. This is not going to be an easy question for you to answer, so don't answer it glibly. Think about it. Are you willing from this day out to die to the me that you have been from this day on back and in, in order to be filled with the abundance of Jesus Christ and operate in his life and power from this day on. Are you willing to swap the you that has been there all this time for the you that is Jesus Christ in you from now on. You willing to do that? You willing to do that, and Jesus is willing to take you up on it. If you're not being willing to do that, you better pray long and hard as to why you're here. Because the reason you're here is from here on out to be Jesus in you. To be Jesus in you. Okay? Example, this is a man you may know about. His name was Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor 
me get this back on here. Hudson Taylor was the founder of the China Inland Mission. It is now called Overseas Missionary Fellowship. I had the privilege of, for 25 years, being the doctrinal screening agent for uh, Overseas Missionary Fellowship slash China Inland Mission. Uh, and that was a, a great privilege indeed. Now, Hudson Taylor, when he went out onto the field in China, quickly ran out of his own resources. He was a doctor, uh, an aspiring medical student. He was a, a very hard worker, but he realized very soon that his resources were not going to be enough to lead the people of China to Jesus Christ. And so he broke down in his health. He came back to England, had to uh, sit it out for a while. But God spoke to his heart in a powerful way and showed the truth of John 15 to him and showed him that he had to exchange his life as Hudson Taylor for the life of Jesus Christ. And so he asked the Lord Jesus, Lord, would you be in me all that you have wanted to be? And at that moment, he swapped his life for Jesus' life in the same way that Jesus swapped his life for the Father's life. And he allowed the Father's power to live and direct everything he did. So Hudson Taylor then allowed the life of the Lord Jesus to live and direct everything he did. And the results were astronomical. Uh, not only the reaching of China, millions and millions of people in, in China who were shared the gospel with, and thousands upon thousands became converts. Um, but also, he established the whole faith mission movement across uh, Europe and America. And so that uh, now, when missions go out, they're operating largely in the uh, pathway set down for them by Hudson Taylor. So Hudson Taylor learned to live his life exchanged for Jesus Christ. So I'm asking you again, are you willing to exchange your life for the life of Jesus Christ? This is how Paul later expressed this. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. So the old Paul was dead. It is no longer I, Paul, who live, but Christ lives in me. That's the exchange life, Christ living in Paul. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. Uh, how many of you have that memorized by now? You have that down pat? A couple of you. Uh, every one of you should memorize that verse. All of us, Cape and Ray, memorize that verse. And I, I can... Uh, that's the verse that I shared at my baptism. Every new Christian should learn that verse. Here's how he said it, whoops, here's how he said it uh, later on. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So the grace of God, what was providing the indwelling Lord Jesus control in his own life. We need to stop there and uh, we'll, we'll take it up there.